We want to talk about the Eddington limit, in particular how it is a feeding constraint on supermassive black holes. So if we come over here, this is a sketch, a very simplified sketch of, of what we want to talk about. We imagine we have a supermassive black hole, and around the supermassive black hole is an accretion disk. The supermassive black hole is feeding on infalling ionized gas, and the accretion disk is getting brighter. The accretion disk, because of the gravity of the uh, black hole, the material that falls in around the accretion disk gets heated to very high temperatures, and it will emit radiation, light, X-rays, gamma rays, and on the other side, infrared and, and radio. So what we're showing here is this shell of gas falling towards the accretion disk, and we're saying a lower luminosity of the accretion disk at some earlier time. And we're just indicating that here L earlier. And then at some later time, the matter in this shell of gas, some of it has started to fall in the accretion disk. The accretion disk appears brighter, the luminosity goes up, higher luminosity of the accretion disk. And I'm trying to show that with this shaded region. See, there's a shaded region around here that's larger than this one, indicating a higher luminosity of the accretion disk. So, um, we can think of a particle out at infinity, which is going to come in to the accretion disk. And we could say that that particle, the kinetic energy of that particle, will be the mass of the particle times the mass of the accretion disk times the gravitational constant divided by R, and R here is the distance from the center of the black, from the black hole to, to the accretion disk, roughly speaking. And we can look at the change in the kinetic energy as a function of time, and we can relate that to the intensity. The kinetic energy is in joules. We do a dk derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to time. We now have joules per second. That's watts, or power, and that corresponds to luminosity. And what we'll say is some fraction of that kinetic energy actually gets converted to the luminosity. So if we do the dKe over dt, we'll have a dm over dt. m is constant, even though some material has fallen into the black hole. It's so massive we won't worry about that additional mass, the gravitational constant g and r. So what it looks like is that the luminosity can keep going up as long as dm over dt keeps increasing. More mass, more luminosity from the accretion disk. But will that really happen? And uh, the answer is no. And so let's imagine here's the particle coming into the accretion disk, and here's the radiation being emitted by the accretion disk. That radiation will cause a pressure on this particle which is coming in, so it can, can make it stop, in a sense, simply speaking, very simply speaking. And in order to uh, look at this, we have to take a look at something that's called the cross-section. We'll look at a specific case of the cross-section for this. But I just want to take a little bit of a detour and, and look at the case of radar. That's a good way to uh, introduce the idea of cross-section if you're not familiar with it. So here's our radar dish. It's emitting a wave. It goes out to a target, which we'll say is a sphere. And in order to figure out what comes back from that target, you need to know the radar cross-section. And it turns out that in radar, if it's a sphere, the radar cross-section of the sphere is equal to pi r squared. 
And what's interesting about that is there's no wavelength or frequency dependence for the radar cross-section of a sphere. In other cases, for other radar targets, some general target, it'll actually be a function of the frequency or the wavelength. So that's, in a nutshell, the idea of cross-section for radar. So the idea of this cross-section is that it represents and an area, in a sense, that the, ra that the radiation pressure is going to push against. So if we come over here to this figure, it's the same as that first one, except I'm showing a photon coming out from the accretion disk. And it's going to interact with particles in the incoming, infalling gas shell. And what I'm showing here taking this area over here, twisting it a little bit. Here's the photon coming in. And I'm just showing the electrons. And why I'm just showing the electrons will be uh, come clear in, in a bit. So this photon's about to interact with the incoming plasma gas particles. Again, just the electrons. The protons are not shown, but there's an equal number of protons there. I didn't draw them in to clutter things up. And the cross-section that we need for, for that, if you go to... Uh, this text, Astrophysical Concepts by Martin Hewitt, Harwitt, Martin Harwitt. And if you go to his equation 602, he gives an expression that we'll talk about, which is the cross section, the Thomson scattering cross section for electrons. And what you'll see in a second here is that, as in the radar case with the sphere, it is also independent of the frequency of the, in this case, the photon frequency. So this is the general expression in Harwood's book. Uh, I've written it in terms of MKS units, so I have a four pi epsilon zero here. And so what it says is that the scattering cross section for a charged particle is equal to 8 pi over 3 times this quantity squared, the charge squared, divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, times the mass of the particle and the speed of light squared. Now if you look at this for electron, so we're going to look at the cross section for the electron, compared to the proton, you can see that if you take that ratio, everything cancels out because it's all the same. Proton charge is the same as the electron charge. So the only thing that you're left with is this mass. So the ratio of the electron cross-section to the proton is equal to the mass of the proton over the mass of the electron, that quantity squared. The ratio of those masses is easy to remember. It's 1836 squared. If I square that, you can see that the cross-section for the electron is million, over a million times larger than the cross-section for the proton. So all we have to worry about is the electrons. But the electrons are coupled to the protons in the plasma. So if the electron is affected, that effect is actually transferred to the proton. So in a sense, the protons are affected like the electrons. And so for the electron case, the sub-E for the cross-section, the general way to write that is a sub-T for the Thomson scattering cross-section for electrons. So here, sigma-T, Thomson scattering cross-section for electrons. And so we're going to, to need that. So that's the general form that we'll, we'll use for the scattering cross-section. So now, let's say that the average photon emitted by the accretion disk is uh, E equal to H nu. 
And what we want to try to find out is what is the number of particles per square meter per second that are coming to the sphere from the accretion disk. So we would use, say n is the number of particles we're looking at, and it's going to be at a distance r. So if we want to look at the luminosity and spread that over a sphere of radius r, we would have 4 pi r squared. And to get the number of photons, we would then multiply that by one photon over this energy that we had here, h nu. So we have joules per second here for L. We have joules here for H nu. That's not the normal unit that you use for H nu, but it's energy. So the joules cancel out. And so we're, we're left here with the number of photons per second. The L has the joules per second. So we have per second and then per meter squared. So that tells us the number of photons passing through the sphere of radius r passing through a square meter of the sphere every second. Now what we need to do is figure out, and this is where the radar, where the cross section comes in, we, we need to figure out the uh, rate of collision. of the photons with the electrons. So we'll just call that rate collision. And that will be equal to the cross section, the Thompson cross section for the electrons times the number of photons per second per meter squared at a distance r. So now we have rate of collision. The uh, momentum that's going to be transferred, the momentum of the photon uh, from, that's being emitted by the accretion disk. So we'll say the momentum of the photon is going to be equal to h nu over C. That momentum gets transferred uh, to the proton eventually because of the interaction with the electron. The photon interacts with the electron and the electron is coupled to the proton so this basically is going to be a change in momentum for a proton And you know that F equals MA. That can also be written in terms of momentum. So you can write that as DP, DT, just, just a general expression. And in terms of delta, that would be, for what we're working out here, it would be the delta P of the proton over a delta t. Now what are we going to use for a delta t? The rate of collision, um, the units on the sigma t is meter squared. The, the meter squared times the units for the N, uh, nr is going to be a number per second. So you can see there's a time, inverse time in that. So our delta t, let me write the delta t first. So this is going to be the delta p of the proton over the rate of collision minus 1. So if we 
if we work this out, we could say that the force on the proton, the radiative force, is going to be equal to what we have for the proton, H nu over C, over the inverse of the rate for the collision, which is going to be sigma T, NR, here's NR, L over 4 pi R squared and 1 over H nu. And you can see the H nu's cancel out and we're left with sigma T times L over C speed of light times 4 pi R squared. So that's the force from the proton. That's the force on the proton from the photons. Proton. Now we have a gravitational force on the proton. Gravitation. And that's going to be the mass of the proton, mass of the black hole, gravitational constant over R squared. And what we're saying is these two forces, when they're equal, that will stop the inflowing gas. The force on the proton due to gravitation, force on the proton due to radiation. So, what we have then is, we'll set those equal to one another. So we'll have sigma T L over 4 pi R squared with a C. Yeah, sigma T L C 4 pi R squared and that's equal to mass of the proton mass of the black hole, gravitational constant divided by R squared, and you can see the R, R squareds cancel out. So we can find a luminosity now. And this luminosity is referred to the Eddington luminosity. And that is equal to 4 pi C times the mass of the proton times the mass of the black hole, times the gravitational constant, divided by sigma t. So if the luminosity is greater than this value here, the radiation pressure will stop the gas from falling in to the black hole. Let me just check to make sure I didn't make a mistake. 4 pi C, mass of the proton, yeah. So, there are, let's see, we're getting close on time here. There are a couple issues. This is, again, greatly, greatly simplified. Some of the issues are um, we had the spherical uh, gas cloud, plasma, and chances are that it wouldn't be spherical. The other thing, too, is we're considering the luminosity to be isotropic. And that's not likely to be the case. So for those sorts of situations, you can actually probably exceed the uh, Eddington limit. An example of that might be uh, the very active uh, 
nucleus in galaxy M87. That's a elliptical galaxy and has a supermassive black hole in the center and it's putting out two jets of gas. So there are situations where, as an example of M87, where the uh, Eddington limit could be exceeded. And what we'll uh, do later in, in a part two, we'll take a look at stars uh, for the using the idea of the Eddington limit and maybe in part three we'll actually look at what the energy of the photons are. So anyhow this is the expression that we were after the Eddington limit it's radiative pressure that stops the infalling gas and that stopping of the infalling gas could actually blow the gas out of a galaxy and without the gas to form stars, star formation process may slow down. So there's a close connection between supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and the evolution of those galaxies.